Hi, my name is Monty Johnson. I teach philosophy at the University of California, San Diego, and this is the first of two lectures on Aristotle's Politics, Book 7, this one on chapters 1 to 7, which is about the background considerations and material conditions of the perfect state. To give an overall uh, outline of Book 7, and by the way, I'm using the translation of Benjamin Jowett, Oxford, 1921, which is in the public domain. The first three chapters are devoted to the background considerations for the examination of the best political system. In the first chapter, Aristotle's concept of happiness. In the second chapter, how politics relates to happiness. And in the third chapter, how philosophy relates to both politics and happiness. Then the rest of the chapters in the book are concerned with different causes of the perfect uh, state. Chapters four to seven, which will be the rest of this lecture, with the material causes or material conditions of the perfect state, including what kind of population it must have, what kind of territory it must have, its markets and naval power, and the climate, its climate and the character of its people. Then in the next four chapters, 8 to 12, Aristotle discusses the formal parts of the perfect state, and he distinguishes different ways that we conceive of those parts and how those parts are arranged uh, together, for the sake of a certain end. Chapters 13 to 17 then are on what those final ends and final cause of the perfect state are. That is, what Aristotle's final uh, idea about happiness as an end of the state amounts to. And here he makes a transition into his discussion of education, also discussing work and leisure, marriage and procreation, but the education of young children and looking forward to the uh, full discussion of education in Book 8. So in the first chapter, he discusses the best way of life for both individuals and the state, which he ultimately takes to be the same. First, one must uh, know what is the best kind of life in order to know what the best kind of state is. Quote, he who would duly inquire about the best form of a state ought first to determine which is the most eligible life. While this remains uncertain, the best form of the state must also be uncertain. For, in the natural order of things, those may be expected to lead the best life who are governed in the best manner, of which their circumstances permit. We ought therefore to ascertain, first of all, which is the most generally eligible life, and then whether the same life is or is not best for the state and individuals. So how does Aristotle uh, determine what is the generally uh, most eligible life? Well, he refers to his popular works for a satisfactory treatment of the issues, works that have been lost. In fact, he seems to be making a reference specifically to his lost dialogue, the Protrepticus, in which he argues that happiness or prosperity, eudaimonia, requires three kinds of goods. First, goods of the soul, virtues, for example, wisdom, moderation, justice, courage, and so forth. Second, goods of the body, for example, health, strength, beauty, and so on. And finally, external goods, uh, for example, wealth, status, family, and homeland. Now, Aristotle says here in the politics that these distinctions between three kinds of goods are agreed upon by all. Philosophers dispute, however, their proper rank ordering. Here, Aristotle is just concerned to show that those who downplay the importance of virtue and emphasize the importance of external goods like wealth are in fact misguided. External goods like wealth have a natural limit beyond which they are useless or harmful, but no amount of wisdom or justice is excessive, and we should always want more of it. Now, goods, he says, are also ranked relative to the things of which they are goods. And since the soul is superior to the body, then the goods of the soul must be superior to the goods of the body. And since the body is superior to inanimate and external things, the goods of the body must be better than the external goods, like wealth. External goods and the goods of the body basically exist in Aristotle's view, for the sake of the virtues. Virtues like wisdom and justice don't exist for the sake of health or strength, but health or strength exist for the sake of wisdom and justice. And similarly, health and strength don't exist for the sake of wealth and status, but rather we should want wealth or status for the sake of health. 
That this is so is clear from the fact that we characterize God as having the virtues like wisdom and justice, but it would be ridiculous to characterize God as enjoying external goods like wealth or caring about reputation. Again, one can obtain external goods by good luck, but one can't obtain virtues just by luck. So the virtues are, on all accounts, more valuable and more important than external goods. Now, the life of virtue is the best life for both the individual and the state, Aristotle asserts. Like the individual, the happiness or prosperity of the state depends on the flourishing of virtues, both moral virtues like justice and intellectual virtues like wisdom. He says that the happy state may be shown to be that which is best and which acts rightly, and it cannot act rightly without doing right actions, and neither an individual nor a state can do right actions without virtue and wisdom. He also says, courage, justice, and wisdom of the state have the same form in nature as the qualities which give the individual who possesses them the name of just, wise, or temperate. So we can predicate exactly the same terms in the same way of both the individual agents of the state and the, their aggregation into an organization arrangement into a state. He says, let us assume then that the best life, both for individuals and states, is the life of virtue, when virtue has external goods enough for the performance of good actions. So this is very important. Although he rank orders external goods beneath goods of the body and both of those beneath goods of the soul, that doesn't mean by any means that he thinks that goods of the body or external goods are not goods or are not valuable. It's just that we should have the right conception about how they are rank ordered, but we certainly would not want to deny that they are goods and in fact that they're necessary goods, that we require those kinds of goods in order to reach the goods of the soul. Now, in the second uh, chapter, Aristotle inquires into whether the political or philosophical life is better. So everyone agrees that the success of the individual and the state are the same, as we've just said, and we can show by example those who suppose that wealth is what makes a person good suppose that what makes a state good is that it's very wealthy, and those who suppose that it's virtue that makes an individual good also suppose that virtues are what make a state good. Now, it's an ethical question what the best kind of life is for an individual. The political question that we're concerned with is, what is the best kind of constitution or form of government? Now, Aristotle's answer is as follows. He says, it is obvious that the best political system is necessarily that arrangement by which anyone at all could act in the best way and live happily. Now, this is an extremely interesting sentence, and especially the interpretation of anyone at all. What does it mean that anyone at all could act in the best way and live happily? First of all, it seems to mean not anyone at all, absolutely, but anyone among those who can act in the best way will live happily. So those who have the capability, for example, to act in the best way would live happily. And um, that is one interpretation of what the passage means. The question is to what extent Aristotle would allow that this includes uh, all women, all slaves, menial laborers, foreigners, or non-citizens? Uh, to what extent is the state obligated to, uh, the, is the best state arranged to bring about that any of those people uh, could act in the best way and live happily? Well, Aristotle really doesn't address that point, but he returns to the ethical question of what produces happiness. Now, in the ethics, we saw that uh, it can't be wealth that produces happiness. It must be some kind of virtuous activity. But even if we can eliminate the state devoted to wealth, that is oligarchy, the question still remains about what kind of virtuous activity should be promoted. If it's not wealth, 
but virtue, what kind of virtue? And there are many options here. So some will think of military valor. Others will think of just political causes within their own state. Uh, others will think of philosophical activities, including philosophical speculation uh, for its own sake. Now, Aristotle describes this as a dispute arising among people who agree that virtue is the key to the success of both the individual and the state. They just disagree about which virtue. So he says, even those who agree in thinking that the life of virtue is the most eligible raise a question whether the life of business and politics is or is not more eligible than one which is wholly independent of external goods. I mean, more than a contemplative life, which is by some maintained to be the only one worthy of a philosopher. Now, that passage is extremely interesting because it raises the possibility that a philosopher who does not participate in politics, for example, maybe because they're living as a foreigner in another uh, state, as Aristotle did when he went to school in Athens and then stayed on there and perhaps opened his own school, practicing the life of a philosopher, but not obligated really to participate in the business and politics uh, of the city. And one might well think that that's a superior way of life than having to deal with business and politics. So these two kinds of life, he says, the life of the philosopher and the life of the statesman, appear to have been preferred by those who have been most keen in the pursuit of virtue, both in our own times and in other ages. Which is the better is a question of no small moment, for the wise man, like the wise state, will necessarily regulate his life according to the best end. So we've got to figure out what the approach to political power should be. Um, and Aristotle distinguishes here between three of them. First, we'll call the apolitical view. There are some who think that while despotic rule over others is a great injustice, to exercise constitutional rule over them, even though not unjust, is a great impediment to a man's individual well-being. So again, an example of that could be foreigner philosophers who don't feel like participating in politics, ruling and being ruled in turn, but they're kind of aloof from all that so that they can pursue the contemplative life. Opposed to that, a pro-political view that says uh, that Aristotle describes as follows. He says, others take an opposite view. They maintain that the true life of man is the practical and the political, and that every virtue admits of being practiced quite as much by statesmen and rulers as by private individuals. So an example of this would be Athenian Democrats who think everybody needs to do their part and take and contribute to the political uh, sphere. Uh, and that the and that all of the virtues, including wisdom, can be practiced by engaging in politics. This Aristotle distinguishes from another kind of pro-political view, the second pro-political view under consideration. He says, others again are of the opinion that arbitrary and tyrannical rule alone consists with happiness. Indeed, in some states, the entire aim of both the laws and the constitution is to give men despotic power over their neighbors. And the paradigm here is the Spartans, whose entire constitution is organized for the sake of war and military valor. Now, here in the politics, Aristotle does not try to justify a pro-political view as over against an apolitical view, which in other works, like the Nicomachean Ethics, especially Nicomachean Ethics Book 10, Chapter 9, Aristotle ranks as a decisively superior way of life, that the contemplative life is actually better than the life devoted to uh, political and noble activities. Here, he doesn't uh, try to show why, nevertheless, you should participate in politics. Instead, he focuses on arguing that the first kind of pro-political view is superior to the second kind of pro-political view. So the pursuit of constitutional rule is superior to this pursuit of despotic or tyrannical power. And that provides a kind of justification for the pro-political view. It's a justifiable way of life, even if it doesn't perhaps rank as the ultimate 
highest way of life. So against this second pro-political view, uh, Aristotle argues that war, conquest, and in general despotic power cannot be the end of the state, though the Spartan and Cretan uh, constitutions are given as examples of ones organized to aim at war. And being aimed at war, they aim to exercise tyrannical and despotic power. He says, although in most cities the laws may be said generally to be in a chaotic state, still, if they aim at anything, they aim at the maintenance of power. Thus, in Sparta and Crete, the system of education and the greater part of the laws are framed with a view to war. And he gives several other examples, Scythians, Persians, Thracians, Celts, Macedonians. That's an interesting reference because uh, that's Aristotle's homeland. He also mentions Iberians. Now, despotism and tyranny cannot be the end of statesmanship, he argues, very vehemently. Quote, to a reflecting mind, it must appear very strange that the statesman should always be considering how he can dominate and tyrannize over others, whether they will or not. How can that which is not even lawful be the business of the statesman or the legislator? Unlawful it certainly is to rule without regard to justice, for there may be might where there is no right. The other arts and sciences offer no parallel. A physician is not expected to persuade or coerce his patients, nor is a pilot expected to coerce or persuade the passengers in his ship. So this isn't uh, at all what statesmanship and politics uh, should be about, forcing people to do things even if it's uh, unjust. The only justifications for domination, Aristotle argues, are natural slavery, the theory of which he lays out in book one, and cases of necessary predation in nature, which is essentially how he justifies natural slavery in book one. So here he says, quote, such behavior is irrational unless the one party is and the other is not born to serve, in which case men have a right to command, not indeed all their fellows, but only those who are intended to be subjects, just as we ought not to hunt mankind whether for food or sacrifice, but only the animals which may be hunted for food or sacrifice. That is to say, such wild animals as are edible or eatable. So just as there's a natural fact of the matter about which animals are edible, so there's a natural fact about which people are born to serve as slaves, and over them alone is it just and uh, right to exercise uh, empire and despotic uh, power. The general pursuit of trying to enslave or tyrannize over the whole world or over a whole uh, region is uh, a perversion of justice, a perversion of nature. It runs contrary to nature and contrary to the purposes of the state. So happiness and the good life, again, are the end of the state, not war and conquest. War and conquest cannot be the end of the state because we could imagine a state to flourish without any war or conquest. Aristotle says, quote, Surely there may be a city happy in isolation, which we will assume to be well governed, for it is quite possible that a city thus isolated might be well administered and have good laws. But such a city would not be constituted with any view to war or the conquest of enemies. All that sort of thing must be excluded. Hence, we see very plainly that warlike pursuits, although generally deemed to be honorable, are not the supreme end of all things, but only means. Now, there are many interesting things about that, but one thing we'll need to compare that with is what Aristotle later says in chapter 6 of this very book 7 about the necessity of the ideal city having communication, trade, and warfare with foreign states. Here, at least, he envisions the possibility that even without any trade or communication, much less warfare with external states, a city could nevertheless be happy, assuming that it is well governed. That theoretical possibility shows that there is another end and that the happiness of the state must reside uh, elsewhere. And Aristotle says that the good 
Lawgivers should inquire how states and races of men and communities may participate in a good life and in the happiness which is attainable by them. His enactments will not always be the same, and where there are neighbors, he will have to see what sorts of studies should be practiced in relation to their several characters or how the measures appropriate in relation to each are to be adopted. But uh, in general, the whole point of politics is to figure how, out how, given a certain state and certain constitution of its citizens, how its political system may be arranged and constituted so as to bring about the good life and happiness. Now, that the positive conception of what that good life or happiness is for Aristotle is a life devoted to virtue and specifically an active life of virtue. And so he next addresses people who, while they agree that the life of virtue is the most eligible way of life, differ about the manner of practicing it. For some renounce political power and think that the life of the freeman is different from the life of the statesman and the best of all. But others think that the life of the statesman is best. So with that quotation, he raises this question yet again of the apolitical way of life versus the political way of life. But he says that both the life of the apolitical free man, for example, a philosopher, and the life of the statesman can be good and noble. Certainly the life of the apolitical free man is superior to the life of wielding despotic or tyrannical power. The main focus is to show that um, the other way of life is also uh, good and uh, is considered an active pursuit of virtue. In fact, those who embrace that way of life uh, the argument that they make for the life of the statesman is that one who does nothing cannot do well, and that virtuous activity is identical with happiness. Now, uh, so w if, if you could describe philosophers as leading, these, these apolitical freemen as leading inactive lives, then um, you could argue that since happiness is a kind of activity and re certainly requires activities, then that life of the apolitical free man cannot uh, be the best way of life. Aristotle says, it is equally a mistake to place inactivity above action, for happiness is activity, and the actions of the just and wise are the realization of much that is noble. But, he argues, the active life can in fact be lived without either pursuing tyrannical power or war, but even in a state isolated from other states, and even within a state in isolation from other individuals. So here's a uh, necessarily long quotation. Not that a life of action must necessarily have relation to others, as some persons think, nor are those ideas only to be regarded as practical which are pursued for the sake of practical results, but much more the thoughts and contemplations which are independent and complete in themselves, since virtuous activity, and therefore a certain kind of action, is an end. And even in the case of external actions, the directing mind is most truly said to act. Neither again is it necessary that states which are cut off from others and choose to live alone should be inactive, for activity, as well as other things, may take place by sections. There are many ways in which the sections of a state act upon one another. Here he has in mind sections like the rich and the poor, or the different occupations that make up the city, or the different uh, elements that uh, correspond to each constitution. But he says, the same thing is equally true of every individual. If this were otherwise, God and the universe, which have no external relations over and above their own energies, would be far enough from perfection. So there's nothing outside the universe, yet the universe is uh, perfect. And so it has to be possible that you can be perfect even without being in relation to anything outside of you. Same goes for God. Hence, it is evident that the same life is best for each individual and for states and for mankind collectively. Now, after that uh, heady discussion of what's the best way of life and the conclusion that it's an active life of virtue 
and that this even permits a kind of active life of philosophical contemplation, although it will certainly also include an active life devoted to the moral virtues and the social, moral, uh, political activities within the state. After discussing all of that, he turns to discussing the material conditions of the perfect state. He says, in what has proceeded, I've discussed other forms of government. In what remains, the first point to be considered is what should be the conditions of the ideal or perfect state. For the perfect state cannot exist without a due supply of the means of life. So these chapters are very important because they specify what Aristotle considers to be necessary conditions for his ideal state coming about. These are things that he will suppose in the account and not show how they are to be provided. That is the object of some other kind of inquiry. These are the things he will assume are in place. A certain number as to population, a certain size of territory, a certain amount of communication with other cities, especially by naval capabilities and access to trade, and also, and probably most importantly, certain characteristics of the population that is ruled, certain character traits that they have, and some of these are determined by the climate. So first, about the population. Very interesting topic. Aristotle begins by saying that we should not confuse the amount of population with the greatness of the state. The greatness of the state, in his view, depends on how well it performs its function, which again is living well for the citizens. It doesn't really matter how many people it governs, uh, so long as it performs that function. Further, a city may include a large or even majority population that are not even citizens, but are merely visitors or slaves. Such people, Aristotle argues, should not be factored into the greatness of a city. Even the quantity of citizens is not the most important thing. A city that, for example, had many artisans but few warriors may be inferior to a city not as great as a city that has few artisans but many warriors, for example. Cities, he argues, that are too populous are impossible or difficult to govern well. Here, Aristotle appeals to empirical evidence and also to argument. So he says a very great multitude either cannot be orderly or would require a superhuman godlike power in order to order it. All natural things, he points out, have natural sizes and limits that are within certain bounds. This is true of plants, animals, humans, so forth. A state uh, is also a natural thing, and so it must within exist within certain limits and certain bounds. Even artifacts have natural limits or boundaries or sizes. So a ship, for example, that was smaller than a thumbnail or larger than an entire continent would not actually be a ship because it wouldn't be able to perform the function of a ship. In like manner, a state, when composed of too few people, is not as a state ought to be self-sufficient, but when it's composed of too many people, though self-sufficing in all mere necessaries, as a nation may be, it is not a state, being almost incapable of constitutional government. For who could be the general of such a vast magnitude? Or who the herald, unless he have the voice of a stentnor? So one limit, uh, Aristotle points out on governing them, uh, governing people, is the limit of what can be heard. So the media of communication with the other citizens. Uh, you could get a few thousand people into an amphitheater that's well designed, but beyond that, there is no technology for amplifying the voice to go further. Now, it's interesting to think about, you know, what affects something like uh, telephones or television or the internet would have on this analysis. Would Aristotle change his view because the new technologies make it possible to communicate with a much larger group of people now? Or would he think that still the natural size of a political system should be much smaller and that despite these technological advancements, uh, we haven't improved our politics at all. In fact, our per perhaps our politics are worse 
uh, and as a result of being of a scale that is just too big to be able to govern without some superhuman or godlike power. So he takes a kind of pragmatic approach. What should be the limit, he says, will be easily ascertained by experience for both governors and the governed have duties to perform the special functions of a governor to command and to judge. But if the citizens of a state are to judge and to distribute offices according to merit, then they must know each other's characters. Where they do not possess this knowledge, both the election to offices and the decision of lawsuits will go wrong. When the population is very large, they are manifestly settled at haphazard, which clearly ought not to be. So very interesting observation. You can't really, for example, engage in true democratic politics unless you know the other citizens. You have to know them, speak to them, understand what kind of characters they have. Uh, that enables you to deliberate with them and reach decisions uh, with them. Uh, if we don't really know each other's character, then on what basis are we electing each other to offices? Perhaps elections where we don't know the people's character but are based on something else, like clever advertising or focusing on, on irrelevant things. Uh, the same problem could happen in lawsuits. You just don't know the characters of the people involved as well. Whereas if the citizens all actually know each other, then it, they are more capable of judging of each other's characters for the sake of both lawsuits and elections. So in Aristotle's considered view, the best limit of the population of a state is the largest number which suffices for the purposes of life. And he basically summarizes this by it should be able to be taken in in a single view. So you want a pretty big city, you want it to be a, a fairly great uh, magnitude, but, enough, but limited enough that it can be taken in in one view and you could really have all of the citizens know each other and be able to communicate with each other and be able to watch out for each other's character. Now, the second material condition of the perfect state is territory of a certain size. The territory should afford as much self-sufficiency or autarky as possible. That, that is, the territory should be able to support a liberal character, but also temperate lifestyles. So it has to be sufficiently large to support many citizens and the possibility of them being generous with their possessions towards each other in order to exercise this very important virtue of generosity or liberality they have to have a certain amount of wealth and so that's going to require households of a certain size a certain number of slaves a certain amount of livestock and all of that's going to require a certain amount of territory but aristotle argues the territory should not be so large that it would support excessive consumerism and waste and that sort of thing. So, as always, he's looking for the kind of, uh, m you know, uh, mean between an extreme and uh, two extremes, an excess and a deficiency. You don't want it deficient so that you can't support all of the uh, promotion of virtues and lifestyles that you want, but you don't want it uh, so large that it actually is able to support uh, vices. So the exact amount of the territory will actually depend on an investigation into the ethical virtues and vices of things like liberality versus meanness and moderation versus overindulgence. Besides that, there's some practical things to be considered. Of course, a territory should be easily defensible along with the countryside, but also convenient for transportation. Again, Aristotle repeats the benefit of being able to take in the whole city with a single view. The third uh, material conditions of the perfect state, the third set that he discusses, access to trade. So here he acknowledges that most cities cannot in fact be entirely autarkic or materially self-sufficient, so they will have to engage in trade. Uh, for one thing, they will have 
too much of some things and not enough of other things. And so in order to get those things they don't have enough of, they will trade the things that they have too much of, and then that will supply the hypothetical requisites for them to be able to uh, engage in virtuous activities like generosity. But uh, if they are to engage in trade, then there will arise questions about the interaction between the citizens and foreigners. And some people make an argument, for example, against having easy sea communication. It's argued that trading by sea in general is inimical to good government because it requires a crowd of merchants coming and going and an increase in population of slaves, traders, and in general foreigners who are brought up under other laws, and so they aren't habituated to the laws of the state. But an argument for having easy sea communication takes into account various military and market considerations like benefits of troop, resupply, exporting what you have in excess, importing what you're deficient in, and so on. And to some extent, maritime power, Aristotle says, is not only advantageous, but is indicative or even constitutive of a great state. Now, a possible solution to the problem caused by having needing a fairly large naval presence would be to place the harbor and the trading markets outside of the city proper so that you could sort of keep all of those foreign uh, elements that haven't been habituated into the proper laws of the state in a different uh, region entirely. Interesting that Aristotle does not here mention or even seem to allow the possibility which was mentioned earlier in uh, chapter 2 of this book 7. Uh, he, there he mentioned a city isolated from all of its neighbors but nevertheless being a perfect city. He said, surely there could be a city that's happy in isolation, which we will assume to be well-governed. For, he said, it's quite possible that a city thus isolated might be well-administered and have good laws. Now, the fourth set of material conditions of the perfect state, climate and character. So, Aristotle engages in a kind of anthropology here that dis divides the races of human beings on on the known world into Europeans, Asians, and Greeks. Europeans, by which he has in mind roughly the peoples north and west of Greece, Scythians, Gauls, etc. About them, he says, those who live in a cold climate and in Europe are full of spirit, but wanting in intelligence and skill, and therefore they retain comparative freedom, but have no political organization and are incapable of ruling over others. On the other hand, a kind of opposite uh, extreme are Asians, by, and he has in mind peoples roughly to the south and east of Greece, for example, Persians and Egyptians. About them, he says, quote, whereas the natives of Asia are intelligent and inventive, they are wanting in spirit, and therefore they are always in a state of subjection and slavery. So actually, both of those Europeans and Asians are described as essentially being worthy of subjection and slavery. The Europeans, because although uh, they are courageous and spirited, they're unintelligent and kind of dumb and incapable of uh, ruling over other people. So the suggestion is they need to be ruled over by others. Uh, the Asians are said to directly, uh, they're just described as being in a state of perpetual subjection and slavery, as this is inevitable, because unlike the Europeans, they're actually intelligent and inventive, but wanting in spirit, and so not courageous enough to uh, assert their own freedom. Now, fortunately, the Greeks lie in the kind of sweet middle spot between these two extremes. Aristotle says, quote, but the Hellenic race, which is situated between them, is likewise intermediate in character, being high-spirited and also intelligent. Hence, it continues free and is the best governed of any nation. And if it could be formed into one state, would be able to rule the world. Now, that is a very unusual passage for a lot of 
reasons. First, the idea of uniting Greece into one state is a strange uh, fantasy, but it's part of this kind of uh, pan-Hellenic um, concept that was popular uh, around the time that Aristotle was writing. Uh, but the idea that uh, e even if you could form it into one state, it would then be able to rule the world. It seems to foreshadow the ambitions of uh, Alexander the Great or something like that. But Aristotle says nothing more about this. And um, again, he said that the purpose of the state is not um, empire and despotic power and subjecting everybody to slavery. So it seems um, like a, a, a strange sort of comment. Now, he acknowledges that Greek tribes also show differences of character among themselves, and some Greek tribes are more intelligent, some are uh, more courageous, and there's every kind of uh, mixture again among them. The perfect state under discussion here, he says, will be assumed to, tho to be those who are both intelligent and courageous. And so this will be, um, you know, Greeks like Athenians, um, intelligent and courageous at the same time. Now, be able to rule the world, I think, does not necessarily envision something like world government, but the idea is that they could set up colonies in any area of the world and would be able to rule in those uh, parts of the world. And this seems to reflect an actual realistic, as opposed to a science fiction fantasy, a realistic idea about the context of what he's writing about, because there is colonization going on in both European and Asian regions, as he describes them, that is, Greeks setting up new cities. And it's this context when you're setting up a new city where it would actually be relevant to consider things like the character of the population that you are subjecting and ruling, but also the territory, the um, town planning, the position of the harbor. Things like that can no longer be changed in Athens or Sparta. So why are they part of a political theory? Well, they're part of a theory of how you would put a good state together were you to establish another one. It's not just an envisioning of a utopian uh, political arrangement, but a concrete discussion, perhaps, of what should happen in colonization. Now, as a kind of um, coda, at the end of chapter 7, Aristotle discusses a, a really interesting point, whether you should be less critical towards your own country than you are towards other countries, or should you be more critical towards your own country? It seems a bit tangential to the main subject of the chapter, but Aristotle criticizes Plato's argument that the ruling class, the guardians, should, quote, be friendly towards those they know, but fierce towards those they don't know. And he's refer referring to a famous passage in Book Two of the Republic. Now, Aristotle says that this is wrong on both counts. First, Quote, the spirit within us is more stirred against our friends and acquaintances than against those who are unknown to us, because this kind of passion begets friendship and enables us to love. So we should be more angered, for example, if our close friend does something wrong, than if a distant acquaintance does. And also, if our own country or city does something wrong, we should be more upset and angered and passionate about it than if a foreign country does something wrong. On the other hand, one should not be more fierce towards those we don't know, for, quote, we ought not to be out of temper with anyone, and a lofty spirit is not fierce by nature, but only when excited against evildoers. And this, as I was saying before, is a feeling which men show most strongly towards their friends if they think they have received a wrong at their hands. And indeed, it is reasonable for besides the actual injury, they seem to be deprived of a benefit by those who owe them one. Now, this is applicable to the modern world. So to take an example just from a few years back, during the Cold War, it was common to have Americans, for example, denounce human rights abuses occurring in the Soviet Union. But not as common 
for them to acknowledge their own abuses. And I think this is exactly parallel to a situation in which Soviet intellectuals were quicker to criticize American abuses and less often critical of Soviet ones. According to Aristotle, this should be exactly the opposite. Americans should be criticizing American abuses more than Soviet ones. Americans should be criticizing where they fall short in human rights. Uh, it's less to the point to criticize human rights abuses going on in China or in uh, Russia than it is in your own country. First of all, the passion should be fired up just like you'd be more fired up if your close friend did something wrong than if some distant foreigner and stranger did. And also, you should let people in that country worry about uh, opposing the injustices that occur in there. And so that's an interesting theoretical discussion that Aristotle uh, engages in here at the end of um, both a very heady and abstract discussion of the presuppositions about happiness, politics, and philosophy that should govern the discussion of the perfect state, but then also a sort of brass tacks discussion of material requirements of the perfect state. Thank you.